I'm Kareem Ray, your host at the One Soccer Nation podcast. And today we're thrilled to have Alex Mejia, a seasoned professional in the football industry and a notable figure in the soccer community. Alex brings a wealth of experience from his extensive work in team logistics, fan engagement, and as part of the FIFA fan movement. Join us as we dive into his journey and perspectives on the beautiful game. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time today. How's it going? I'm very good. Thank you. And thank you, Karim, for having me on in your show. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you on. Could you, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask is, could you just take us back in time and, and share how you got involved in the beautiful game? Yes. So I'm originally from Mexico. I was born and raised in Hermosillo, Sonora. And I do have a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Sonora. And when I finished my career, I decided to move to Canada for a life change. So now I'm probably Canadian after living for almost 15 years. And the first years were also difficult because just like any other immigrant, you have to adapt uh, to this country. But I just managed as best as I could to adapt. And one avenue to do that was through soccer. And so while I was, you know, during my first couple of years, I started playing soccer, meeting other people just like me that love the game, love the sport, just to socialize um, because they just literally moved to the country with no family. And we just started to make like bonding and friendship relationships. And just soccer was the like the common denominator between all of us. I when I was young, uh, where I come from, the like let's say the regional or local sports are where I come from is baseball and basketball. Of course, the national sports is soccer. So I always follow that, like of course the World Cups, Copa Americas, and stuff like that. But when I moved here, maybe the fact that I was gone. I, I was away from home. It just made me feel like soccer was a way how to feel still connected with my culture, with my family, you know, where I came from. So I just started following soccer more like obsessively. And one team that I started following more was the Mexican national team. So I started like reading news reports on a daily basis, who got injured, who scored, when's the next game, when's the next tournament, stuff like that. And then I realized that um, um, from a Mexican outlet, media outlet, um, they interview a, a volunteer who participated in the Ukraine-Poland Euro in 2012 as a volunteer. And then that's when I realized that sporting mega events uh, require volunteers. So I just decided to, hey, if this guy did it, I want to do it too. So I looked I looked on, online and just did some research about the upcoming tournaments. And at that moment, at that time was 2013, or like just 2012, 2013. And the Confederations Cup in Brazil was the next tournament ahead. So I applied and thankfully I got selected. So I went to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to participate at the 2013 FIFA World, uh, sorry, Confederations Cup at the Maracana Stadium in the hospitality uh, area, area or department. So for me it was a, a life changer because that's when I realized how much work has to be done behind the scenes in order to have all these mega sporting events uh, to make them successful. There's a lot of work, a lot of organization, and I was only part of the tournament in the execution portion, let alone like all the planning, those the, the planning for those sporting mega events take years and years. So volunteering was my first experience in the soccer industry overall. Amazing. You know, a lot of people want to play the game and be a professional football player or soccer player and play on the field. Um, you know, but sometimes don't realize the other opportunities that lie within the beautiful game off the pitch or that still are on the pitch, but in different positions, you got referees, linesmen, cameramen, you know, coaches, scouts, agents, so on and so forth. So why did you choose the path that you were on? Why not become a referee or uh, an agent or a coach or, you know, um, a broadcaster, why did you choose the path that, that you're on? 
yeah, it's. I think it's because um, just how I perceive my first experience as a volunteer in the hospitality area, which is very customer service based. You have to be there to make sure the the guests are happy. They they get what they need. They arrive on time. They find their seats quickly. So it's just more customer service oriented. Whereas you know, of course, we all are part. We all need to do our job in the best of our abilities. But I feel like the customer service portion or side of things really caught my attention. And uh, yeah, so uh, right now I'm I'm very happy to say that since that tournament or that experience, uh, I have accumulated 10 years of experience in different ways. Volunteers has been one of them, but it's just been adding up onto what I have uh, acquired in the in the past uh, like decade from the volunteering standpoint i also col collaborated with a couple of um spanish uh canadian based media outlets covering the game the women's game the men's game and of course uh with my recent like uh, opportunities to work at the professional club level with with uh fc edmonton and, and now with uh my participation in leaks cup so I feel like the customer service point really is what uh are what I like, what I do enjoy. But at the end of the day, you all you also need to follow what you you like the most. Some some people are really into like the tactic side of things, which I totally understand and respect. But it's just it's just personal preference at the end. But also it has to be it has to come along with preparation, with good networking. You need to understand the area and the industry because the standards are pretty high and the more tournaments you get involved, you get more experience, you get to know other people that that can give you advice and guidance about how can you do your job better. So all that really matters into what you can achieve as a soccer uh, industry or expert professional. Absolutely. You mentioned volunteering. You recently did um, volunteer at the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. How was that? Yeah, it was an amazing experience because, uh, first of all, I got to that opportunity by being the in the community of as a FIFA fan uh, movement member. So it's just one thing got me to another thing. And at, while I got selected to uh, participate at the FIFA World Cup in Qatar, I already had two volunteer FIFA volunteer experiences previously, plus my uh, experience with FC Edmonton. So all that really got in, it got into consideration to to receive this opportunity. But the tournament was excellent. The venues were top class, and the people were very friendly. It was very organized, clean, um, and of course, what just happened on the pitch. Everybody saw it like it was very competitive, very exciting. And I got to the opportunity to meet other people. Also, I got the opportunity to see other volunteers that I saw in the 2018 World Cup, in the 2013 uh, Confederations Cup. So it's just very uh, interesting to see that other people are also in the same like boat as as me in this case. Um, and they just kept applying and applying. And yeah, it's interesting to to also end up seeing other people that you have worked with in previous events. Got it. I've heard that there were the stadiums were really close in Qatar, so people were able to go to multiple games. How many games did you attend to and which one was your favorite game to go to? Um, that's a great question. I got I attended I worked in seven games, but I, I also I went as a fan to like maybe three or four, can remember right now. But definitely my favorite game, I mean, even though despite the uh, the result, but was the Argentina-Mexico game. That was an amazing game. Uh, just see Messi, that was my first time seeing Messi live. And of course, the Mexican national team. Uh, I also got to see the three uh, matches that Canada play in. So that was also very cool to see uh, Alfonso Davies scored for the first time uh, in a World Cup in stage. So those are really memories that will stay forever in, in my mind. Amazing. You know, Messi, 
seeing somebody play on TV versus seeing some play, someone play in real life, did Messi meet your expectation of the quality he, he plays on the field that you got to see in life, in real life, in person? Yeah, absolutely. Like he's top class. He doesn't need to run. As he's fast, but of course there are other players that are faster than him at right now or when the World Cup happened. But it's just the experience, the technique, the pace, uh, the vision, like how he anticipates. He was like the game changer in that game against Mexico, and of course throughout the whole tournament and in the final, including. But uh, but yeah, it's just lovely to see people that are so passionate about the game and one of the best players in the world to keep performing at that level for so many years. It's something that uh, it's 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 to applaud, it's to recognize, and and that's why he is who he is. Yeah, I you know what was the score of that game, Mexico versus Argentina? Uh so Messi scored first, and I can't remember the second guy. Who scored? But uh, he was involved in the in the in the play somehow. But uh, Mexico had a couple chances in the first half, but they just didn't capitalize, and that's what happened. When you don't capitalize on your chances, is when you get you know score against, and that's just part of the game. How the game is in modern football now, because right now it's very fast, and and you need to take those opportunities. Yeah, what what was the score? Was it two 0 Argentina? They beat Mexico two two zero. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. that's not too bad, eh? Going against Argentina, I mean, that's a good. Yeah, game. yeah, of course, but yeah, As, I, you know, yeah, I, it was a great game, and yeah, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, it was just a great game, and and yes, uh, at least Mexico managed to win the third game against. Um, Saudi Arabia, but it was just not enough. The the, the like the 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 odds were against them, and then they they conceded at the very end, and that just completely screwed up their plans to advance into the next stage. Got it. Yeah, I've played with a lot of Mexicans in in Canada. On the few, I'm sorry, not a lot. I played with a few Mexicans in Canada, but I played with a lot in Florida, when I was down in Florida, Naples, and, and the talent that you guys have in Mexico and the passion, um, you know, just in general, even just South, South America is very passionate about football. And I, I just love the the passion, the culture, the hunger, the, the playing style. It's, 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 it's an amazing country. Um, you know, before I ask you about FIFA fan movement member, we got the 2026 FIFA World coming up in the next two years. Canada, United States, and Mexico, all three countries are going to be hosting for the first time. What are your thoughts about this? I think it will be a great opportunity for fans to that have never been on this region of the country to see three cultures that are completely different but are so close to each other because of geographical, of course, um, um, purposes, but it will be very good for fans to travel for the ones that have the ability to go to Mexico or come to Canada for the first time, come to the U.S. because they're so rich, in this case Mexico, um, with the culture, the music, the food, the gastronomy, uh, just the passion. When you're in, in, in World Cup stages, and you see the fans from Mexico, and not only Mexico, Latin America, you get like, you get involved with them. You want to chant, you want to jump, you want to sing, you want to wave your flag, you yell, you shake hands, you share high fives. So you definitely uh, get uh, excited about their, even, even if you don't support their team, you still want to cheer with them and, and go, I don't know, go for a drink or just have fun or or just speak or talk about football in general. So I think the interaction between fans will be key to the success of this uh, an upcoming World Cup. Absolutely. What is fa uh, FIFA fan movement? What is that? I've never heard of that before until until now. Yeah, so the FIFA fan movement was a program that FIFA uh, implemented a couple of years back. It's no longer 
uh, running anymore. Uh, it, it, it stopped in, in the Qatar World Cup, but it was just an opportunity to bring fans advice or opinions about certain uh, initiatives that FIFA had in terms of um, content creation on social media or initiatives about upcoming tournaments or events or just to connect really passionate fans that have completely different backgrounds but still promote the game in certain ways, whether you were a coach or a graphic designer or a player or an administrator. So for me, it was a great opportunity to connect with fans from all over the world and learn from what they do and also share experiences. We all, we all, we, we used to have uh, Zoom calls every week and every, every week a new member will have a presentation about what are they doing in their country or in the region or in the local community in terms of like, you know, what are you doing to promote the game and what are you doing to spread the word about football or in this case, uh, women's football. We, we talk about uh, uh, women's football a lot. We also got the opportunity to listen to speakers from FIFA and from stakeholders about what were they doing uh, internally for future campaigns and events. We also got the opportunity to uh, attend live uh, FIFA Best Awards. I, I got invited twice. I didn't go physically, but some of my previous uh, members that joined the movement in the first couple of years were physically invited to, to the FIFA Best Awards. So that was just an amazing experience for them. So at the end of the day, it was an opportunity of value exchange between FIFA, the stakeholders and the fans. That's amazing. I love that FIFA did that and, and that you got to experience that. And it's it's interesting that, that that they would stop something that's as valuable as that to not bring that to the 2026 World Cup. But obviously, with different countries, they do things differently. But um, yeah, that's such an amazing experience. I wish I could experience that. Um, you know, you mentioned FC Edmonton. That's you know, your experience started back in, in May 2019 to October 2019 for six months at FC Edmonton, which is a club that is non-existent anymore in the CPL, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, this is back in 2019 when the league started. And, um, you know, this is this is back home for both of us for in Canada. And you know, it's such an exciting time for Canada to have professional soccer for the first time, a, a League One. Um, you know, how did the opportunity to be a part of FC Edmonton come about? Yeah, it was interesting because at the time when the league was announced, I was in Mexico taking a master degree in football business, actually. And uh, and I knew that the, the league was coming. And of course, I was looking for opportunities. Uh, I knew that FC Edmonton had <clears throat> previous experience were uh, participating as a member of the NASL. And then they they had a hiatus year because there was this transition between NASL to CPL. So when I came back to Canada, I moved to Edmonton. And literally, I just started attending their events for six months, getting to know their staff members, getting to know who work for the team, and so they got to know me. And as soon as an opportunity came, I applied and I got interviewed and I got hired just before the season, the 2019 season started. And I luckily worked for the club for the last four years of its existence. And uh, through different roles, I work in the administration side of things, ticketing, a little bit of ticketing, merchandising, match day operations. And then when there was a change in the coaching staff, I got invited to be part of the team. So I started traveling with the team. I, I have a lot of praise, uh, very good words for uh, the last coach for FC Edmonton, which is Alan Koch. And he gave me the opportunity to be part of the team and, and so I just learned so much from him and from other, my other colleagues as well, from the players as well. It was very important to see from within the locker room how the environment is between players, between coaches, 
of course, you get to see the fans, you get to travel all over the country, you get to see other stadiums. That was very, very cool to see, to see how other clubs operate as well. So it was a very enriching experience for me. But at the end of the day, I really like and I, I feel grateful that I was able to do all that and understand what professional teams required in order to execute. Because the coaches, they need to focus on their job, same as the players. But everything around that, it's literally their club's responsibility. So you have to make sure that you have to create the environment for the players to perform in terms of logistics, uh, airports, hotels, meals, transportation. If something goes off, it definitely clicks in the player's mind and they're not happy, they don't feel comfortable, or how early do you pick the flights? Are the transportation buses on time? How are the meals they're eating at the hotels? All those things you have to take into consideration. And the higher you go in, in organizations, of course, that's even more specialized uh, work that you have to pay attention to because at the end of the day, it shows how much effort you're putting into the organization in order to be successful off the pitch. So, because if you're successful off the pitch, it definitely translate, translates into what happens on the pitch. And so the players are more prepared, the coaches feel supported, and then they can do the job properly. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing answer, Alex. I love that. Um, you know, you've had experience in many different roles. You've engaged with many different people, you know, being a part of the 2018 World Cup, you know, being a part of the 2022 World Cup, working in Canada, coming from Mexico, studying in Mexico, you know, all these all these different things that you're doing. There's a lot of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries that speak different languages that you're communicating with, engaging with. You know, what advice can you share with our viewers that want to learn how to navigate different spaces like yourself within the professional landscape of soccer or football? Yeah, so I feel like the first advice we'll give is build your network before you need it. Because many people, can, it's easy to send emails or messages, and it's okay. I mean, it's okay if you're knocking on doors, but it's important to build relationships to bring value, that's another key part. Like even if you don't know the person and you know what the persons do and you admire their career or you aspire to do something like that person and you have an, any information, maybe you show you you found an article that may be interested to that people, share with that person because that person may, may feel like, okay, that's probably what I was looking for or I was not aware of that information. And that's how you create relationship. LinkedIn is a great platform to build those relationships. So of course, building the network and, and it's gonna sound like very cliche, but preparation, you have to always look for developing your knowledge in the industry, uh, learning new skills, because it's a very demanding industry and it's ever it's always changing so you always need need to stay up to date to what are the new trends what are the new what are certain clubs doing of course depends on the budget of each organization but at the end of the day uh you have to be able to uh be ready for when the responsibilities come your way and even if you don't have the answer you have to be willing to find that answer and, and provide results. Uh, so that's another uh, advice that we'll give to uh, the listeners is that this job is not a nine to five industry. Sometimes, of course, things slow down, in, let's say in the off season or stuff like that. But you have to understand that this is a, a very demanding job and, and you have to you have to be able to respond and, and to present results and deliver. Amazing advice. What advice would you also give to, you know, fellow Mexicans that want to come to Canada or the U.S. or, you know, not only to give this, not only to specify to Mexicans, but, you know, anyone from outside of Canada or the U.S. that are immigrants, to focus on immigrants, what advice would you give to immigrants that are, you know, moving away from their home country to come to Canada 
or you know to the United States because the United States is close by too. What advice would you give to them as immigrants to you know that want to get into the sports landscape? I know that you know um, you know my grandparents are immigrants, so I know how hard it is to to, to start from ground zero and build up. What advice would you give them? I'll say uh, start by learning what do you want? Where do you want to be involved? Because let's say youth soccer or grassroots soccer is different than professional soccer or the college or university soccer. So it's very important that you define where do you want to go. And it's okay to change along the way. If you start in youth soccer and you move to professional or vice versa, but always you need to have a plan. You need to have... Um, your own expectations you need to plan you need to be organized and of course you need to understand the landscape of the soccer in those specific countries whether it's the united states or canada you need to understand how does the soccer system works in canada again if it's professional or, or, or amateur or or youth soccer where are the clubs where are the academies and depending if you're a coach you want to you know, grow your co coaching, uh, you have a, you want to be a coach, w how can you be certified? How can you get acquainted with other coaches that are following the same or uh, start connecting with the events that are happening in your local communities? So it's important that you have to get involved in those, uh, in those relationships, in those discussions, in those tournaments. And that's how people get to know you. You, you, you get to understand how the system or the, the soccer uh, landscape works. And then from there is when you start realizing, okay, well, maybe this is what I like. This is something I can do. And uh, maybe I can start volunteer for certain communities or certain academies. And that's how you're, you, you, you start your, your career. And of course it's okay. It's very good that any soccer knowledge is welcome because soccer at the end is soccer, but it's very different from country to country. So that's something to also to take into consideration. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. Thank you for joining us for this insightful conversation with Alex Mejia. His experience and views have shed new light on the dynamic of soccer operations, fan engagement, and cross-culture communication in the world of soccer. We hope this discussion has inspired you and, and deepened your understanding of the game. Stay tuned for engaging episodes where we continue to explore the fascinating stories and ideas shaping the world of soccer. Alex, thank you again for taking the time for joining us on the One Soccer Nation podcast today. Thank you, Karim, for having me on.